Sue Burke's most recent science fiction novel is Immunity Index, which just came out as a trade paperback. She's also written the science fiction duology, Semiosis. Is it Semiosis or Semosis? And Interference, along with short stories, poems, and essays. She is a literary translator from Spanish into English. And I just lost the rest of it. Just a moment. Just a moment. Here we go. And she currently enjoys life in Chicago. Sue, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read from Chapter 1 of Immunity Index. Irene watched the woolly mammoth shuffle aimlessly. His yard-long shaggy hair gleamed rust brown in the afternoon light. For all his huge magnificence, Nimki looked desolate, pitiful, even out of place, although 10,000 years ago, his kind had dominated North America's grasslands. He stopped dead in his bear pen and rocked back and forth, looked at Irene and rumbled. He recognized her as a source of food, but per not, perhaps not as the person who cherished him more than anyone else did. She got back to work and shoved a bale of grassy hay into the chains that hung from the sling of the crane alongside the pen. The bale weighed half of what she did. Every day, he'd eat seven bales, along with fruit, fresh-cut long grass and alfalfa, a pail of elephant chow pellets, vegetables, and more. A quarter ton of fodder every day. She switched on the motorized winch to lift up the bale and directed the crane's arm to swing over the outer fence, marshy moat, and interior fence, then dropped the hay. Immediately, she reversed the motor to reel up the chains as Nimki rushed at them, jerking his trunk in the air and grabbing at them. He could move gracefully when he wanted, but now he was unhappy. He had reason to be unhappy. So did Irene. Alan, the head of the family that owned the farm, was leaving the house. Is he coming to help me, she thought. Not likely. Nimki gave up on the chains, roared, and ripped apart the bale of hay. A crow cawed on the fence next to the pen, oblivious to the grassy funk of mammoth droppings. The pen desperately needed to be cleaned. Alan came and leaned on the fence. We thought this was going to be a great idea, our own little zoo with a big star animal to show off. It's just not working out. Well, maybe, she thought. No one wants to visit a sad, stinky animal. She began to load some apples into a box for Nimki. I was thinking about getting some passenger pigeons. Maybe that would bring more people. They could visit central Wisconsin the way it used to be. Well, they'd never guess by the way it was now, she knew. Visitors saw endless industrial farms covering sweltering land that only a half century earlier had held cool, beautiful forests. Worse, the farm corporations were pushing for travel restrictions like the ones in Iowa, which would mean no visitors at all. You know, Alan said, I thought I'd feel connected to him. I'm a little Ojibwe. My ancestors knew about mammoths firsthand. That's why we called him Nimki. The name Nimki meant Thunderbird in Ojibwe. A Missouri exotic animal breeding farm had raised him with an elephant, elephant surrogate mother and had called him Big Babar. Irene knew a little about the breeding operation and liked none of it. Nimki had suffered a cheerless childhood in a pen even smaller than the one where it lived now. Alan said, there's always so much to do and the cost for alfalfa just keeps going up. He eats too much. He shrugged and returned to the farmhouse. A twittering flock of sparrows was scavenging inside the pen for bugs in the mammoth scat. Nimki rumbled, glaring at them as if they were stealing his dinner. In July, when Irene had arrived as an unpaid intern, 
Her heart had broken the moment she'd seen the woolly mammoth. Or rather, it had broken when she saw his pen. Six acres had looked bigger in the photos. They showed him standing in a lush, tall grass prairie under wide oak trees, wildflowers brushing his belly. But in real life, the pen resembled an, an inadequate prison exercise yard. The grass and flowers had been eaten or trampled to bare sandy soil, and the savanna oaks ripped apart. Six acres, just over four football fields, was nowhere near enough for a creature who in the wild might range more than 30 miles in a single day. Irene had not expected love at first sight, and now she dreamed of somehow petting him as he towered over her. But if he behaved like a wild adult male elephant, no one could come close. He would assert dominance, and with a casual swipe, he could kill. She hadn't expected love. But was his existence ethical? With only 12 other mammoths alive in North America, he might be alone his whole life, condemned to solitary confinement. Male elephants seemed like loners, but actually led social lives at least as complex as a human's. Humans in solitary confinement went mad. He lived in a little pen at a failing farm where the house had fading siding. The barn had a leaking roof. The shed sat on a cracked foundation and the driveway needed a fresh layer of gravel. On some days, no visitors came to help pay for his fodder. He took the tra she took the tractor to cut some alfalfa for Nimki, hoping to distract herself, but she thought of nothing else the whole time. If she hadn't fallen in love with Nimki, if things didn't change soon for the better, much better, she'd pack her suitcase and go.